Welcome to American Catholic History, brought to you by the support of listeners like you. If you value this content, please become a supporter at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again to our supporters. Your support really means a lot to us, and it makes it possible for us to keep making these episodes. We really couldn't take the time that it takes to put everything together without the support that you give us. Absolutely. Thank you sincerely. And for those of you who have considered becoming supporters, please join us. You can find our support levels and the perks offered at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support, and then join us via Patreon or Locals. Also, thank you for the review views you leave on Apple, especially those five-star ratings. They let Apple know that this is a great podcast and that more people should find it. Yes, indeed. So all that said, on with the show. Today, we're talking about the National Shrine of Our Lady of Lebanon and the Maronite Catholics who built it. The National Shrine of Our Lady of Lebanon is in Jackson Township in Mahoning County, Ohio, just a few miles to the west of Youngstown. I grew up a few miles to the east of Youngstown. It would take about a half hour to drive through and around the city to get from my parents' house to the shrine. And we did go there on occasion when I was growing up. And I actually served a traditional Latin mass in the shrine chapel when I was about 14 years old. Now, I've not been there, but from what you've described, it is, it is an incredibly peaceful and calming place to be. Yeah, it really is. The property is in farm country, and it's, it's nestled up against the Meander Reservoir, which is the water source for Youngstown and a whole lot of other communities in the region. Meander Reservoir is protected, no public access at all, so the shrine's backyard is wooded and protected from development. The land in the other three directions is also mostly countryside because the land the shrine is on was originally a farm. Right. And how it was purchased to become the shrine is a fun part of the story. We'll get to that, as well as to the annual festival and pilgrimage for the Solemnity of the Assumption. But first, let's talk about Our Lady of Lebanon and the Maronite Catholics who brought this devotion to rural Jackson Township, Ohio. Right. So, the Maronites. The Maronite Catholic Church is one of the 23 self-governing Eastern Catholic churches that are in union with Rome. They have their own patriarch based in Lebanon. They have their own liturgy that is based on the ancient liturgy of St. James the Greater, though a number of recent revisions have made it look and feel a whole lot like the Mass of Paul VI. Their distinct Christianity developed in the mountainous region of what is now southeast Turkey in the 4th century, so only about 300 years after Christ. Yes, they trace their heritage to St. Marin, a 4th century priest and mystic who was born in Syria. He went to live in a cave somewhere in the mountains where modern-day Turkey and Syria meet. His holiness and preaching brought many people to live near him and to take up religious practices that he recommended. Good things like fasting, self-denial, and a rigorous prayer life. After his death, priests and faithful of the region carried on these practices, and the center of their ecclesial life moved from the mountains to the ancient city of Antioch. Antioch was one of the earliest Christian cities. The church there had been established by St. Peter himself before he continued to Rome. The Maronites considered Antioch to be their spiritual home, and they lived in peace throughout this region until the Muslims swept in and conquered the region in the 7th century. Most of the Maronites fled to the mountains of Lebanon, south of Antioch. The mountains provided enough of a barrier that the Muslims mostly left the Maronite Christians alone for the next 1,200 years. Right. Not that there weren't skirmishes and battles, but the Maronites were mostly able to live their lives in peace during that time. And thus, the Maronites maintained their customs, their ancient liturgy, and, importantly, their connection with the Bishop of Rome. Right. Many of the ancient Eastern churches broke communion with Rome in 1054. Those became what we now know as the Eastern Orthodox churches. The Maronites did not split with Rome. Things changed for the Maronites in the 19th century, however. A civil war erupted in Lebanon in 1860, and the Maronites got the bad end of the deal. Many thousands of Maronites were killed by the Druze and the Muslims. Maronites fled the region in droves, many going to Egypt, but also to other parts of the world, including Australia, parts of Europe, Brazil, and also the United States. 
Yes, loads of Maronites crossed the Atlantic to find religious liberty and peace in the U.S. By 1890, Maronite priests were tending to stable communities in Boston and New York City. By 1898, Maronites had established a parish in Boston. By the time World War I broke out, Maronites had spread out to many communities across the country, wherever jobs could be found. And this is why they began migrating to Youngstown. Exactly. Youngstown was a fast-growing city at the time on the strength of its rapidly growing steel industry. For a time, the only cities that produced more steel were Pittsburgh and Birmingham, Alabama. And both of those cities were also getting Maronite populations during this time. Right. Wherever there were jobs, the Maronites would go. That, I mean... Kind of works out that way. It sounds sensible. Yeah. (laughs) Something else happened within the global Maronite community during this time. They adopted a particular devotion to Our Lady under a new title. Yes, and this is so important for Maronites in general, but especially for those who are far from their traditional homeland. Well, many thousands of Maronites had fled Lebanon and that region. Many more thousands stayed, and these retained their faith and their customs. In 1904, they placed Lebanon and all Maronites under the protection of Mary. 1904 was the 50th anniversary of the solemn declaration of the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, so it was a good time to do this. A shrine was established on a high hillside in the town of Harissa, about 10 miles northeast of Beirut, the Lebanese capital. They gave Mary the title Our Lady of Lebanon, and three years later, in 1907, a 28-foot-tall statue of Our Lady of Lebanon was erected on a conical stone tower at the shrine. The statue, produced in France, was made of bronze and painted white. Mary is standing in this depiction with one leg bent as though she is gently striding forward. Her hands are down with palms out in a gesture of welcome, and her eyes, though lowered, are gazing forward. The statue, standing on its tower, is oriented toward Beirut, as though Mary is beckoning to her children in that city to come to her. The tower on which she stands is 65 feet tall and has a staircase that wraps around it so the pilgrims can climb to the foot of the statue itself. This shrine quickly became an important site of pilgrimage and is now considered one of the most important sites for Marian devotion in the world. For Maronites around the world, this new way to be connected to the homeland became especially important. In the United States, communities grew and Latin Rite dioceses established parishes for the Maronite faithful. By the beginning of World War I, there were 22 Maronite parishes in the United States, and 10 years later, that number had grown to 37, with 46 Maronite priests. One of those parishes was St. Maron in Youngstown. By 1922, 700 Maronites lived in Youngstown, and they usually had a resident priest. Beginning in 1939, that priest was the very capable Father Peter Ede. Father Ede proved an important figure for Maronites in the U.S. as a whole. In the 1950s, he was one of the main drivers behind establishing a seminary for Maronite priests in the U.S. Our Lady of Lebanon Seminary opened in 1960 in Washington, D.C., and is the only Maronite seminary outside of Lebanon and Rome. That project received significant support from Cardinal Patrick O'Boyle, the Archbishop of Washington. During that same time, Other conversations with Cardinal O'Boyle centered on establishing a national shrine to Our Lady of Lebanon here in the U.S. On this as well, Father Ede took the bull by the horns. In 1960, he was driving through farm country in central Mahoning County. While driving, he was struck by a large, undeveloped tract of land that was for sale. He stopped by the home of the lady who owned it. She received him, but was not amenable to his suggestion that it was perfect for a large Marian shrine. She dismissed him, saying she would never sell to Catholics. Famous last words. Father Ede was not put off that easily. He believed that Our Lady had directed him to this property and that she wanted her shrine to be built there. So he returned to the lady's home a few more times, hoping that time would have softened her. To no avail. Finally, on his third visit, he told her, This is my last visit, but... I am going to call my friends and we will pray for nine days so that he will tell you to sell us the land to build a sanctuary for his mother, Mary. When he got home, Father Ede called his brother, who was also a Maronite priest, and the word spread to other Maronite priests to pray this novena. Well, it didn't take all nine days. Before the novena was finished, the woman called Father Ede and told him, Priest, 
come and take the land. Your lady is bothering me in my sleep. I just love that. Clearly, Mary wanted the shrine as much as Father Eve did. I know, right? The purchase was completed and plans for the shrine began to take shape. Ground was broken on Sunday, August 16th, 1964, 60 years after the original shrine of Our Lady of Lebanon over in Lebanon was established. The conical stone tower and statue both were modeled to be exact replicas of the originals in Lebanon, just smaller. Less than a year later, on July 20th, 1965, a statue of Our Lady of Lebanon was hoisted into position. This statue was carved out of rose granite and stands 16 feet tall, and the tower on which it stands is about 50 feet tall. As a sign, taken as God's favor on the endeavor, just as the statue was secured, a rainbow burst across the sky, though the day had not been stormy. The following month, on the Solemnity of the Assumption, August 15th, the shrine was dedicated and the statue was blessed by James Malone, Auxiliary Bishop of Youngstown. The multi-day celebration which accompanied this great occasion became an annual pilgrimage for Maronites and other Catholics near and far. Yes, that festival and pilgrimage celebrates its 58th year this August, and it has grown. Thousands of people come every year for at least part of the three-day festival from August 13th to 15th. The present rector of the shrine, Core Bishop Anthony Spinoza, says that people come from all over, with some coming as far away as Virginia, upstate New York, Minnesota, Texas, and even California. But unlike today, the conditions at the shrine haven't always been wonderful for welcoming pilgrims. That first year in 1965, the plumbing and water supply was under-equipped to handle the hundreds of people who came. This was farm country, remember? There was no public sewage or water utility. The wells they drilled didn't supply enough water. Also, the pavilion they initially erected for liturgies was glass-walled, uninsulated, and it was not air-conditioned. The candles would literally melt in their holders just from the ambient temperatures. In 1966, the second annual pilgrimage was nearly canceled due to water issues, but the local Isley's headquarters sent out a 3,800-gallon milk truck with water in it to make sure that the pilgrimage happened. You Now, you probably have no idea who Isley's is. But. Well, actually, I do know about Isley's. My aunt lives in Pittsburgh and used oh, right. to supply us with chipped ham. That's right. I, you know what? I forgot about your relatives in Pittsburgh possibly having that connection. Uh -huh. Very nice. So you do know the glory of Isley's. <laughs> Anyhow, for those who don't know about Isley's, it was a dairy chain here in the Midwest and obviously in Pittsburgh that operated delis and convenience store type things. They were known for their ice cream and their chip chop ham, which is what you were familiar with. They were a local institution and folks of my parents' generation talk of them fondly. So it was kind of was pretty cool to find out that they had played such a key role in helping make the second pilgrimage happen. Yeah, really cool. Yeah. Anyhow, water issues continued to plague the site until 1980 when utilities were finally extended from one of the nearby municipal. But the festival and pilgrimage continued every year despite the uncertainty and hardship. Over the years, many Maronite families and youth came out to improve the grounds. The people loved this home away from their Lebanese home. Other things changed over the years. First, they built a visitor center with a large event space and a very nice gift shop just behind the shrine. Also, the 450-seat Prince of Peace Chapel replaced the inadequate glass pavilion in the 1970s or 80s. In 2014, one year before the 50th annual pilgrimage, the shrine and its chapel were named a minor basilica by the Vatican. And then on the 50th anniversary, as though God wanted to restate his approval of the good things happening at the shrine, another rainbow burst across the sky during the final outdoor liturgy for the Assumption on August 15th. Again, this was despite it not being a rainy day. And I actually went to the festival a few years back. I think it was in 2016, actually. I was there on the second and third days, and I absolutely had a, had a great time. I loved it. The event space called the Cedars Hall at the Woods is filled with amazing Lebanese food. The kibbeh and the stuffed grape leaves and the lamb. I mean, my, my mouth is watering just thinking about it. Nowadays, the presence of Maronite Catholics is very stable in the United States. It has grown due to continued immigration from Lebanon, especially since the Lebanese Civil War broke out in 1975. Two eparchies, which is the Eastern Catholic equivalent of a diocese, now serve Maronite Catholics in the U.S. The first was the Eparchy of St. Maron, based in Brooklyn, New York. It was established in 1966. 
Then, with the growth of the Maronite presence, Pope St. John Paul II established the Eparchy of Our Lady of Lebanon of Los Angeles in 1994. And every year, the bishops of both eparchies join the flood of pilgrims that make their way to rural Jackson Township, Ohio, for a celebration of Maronite Catholicism. On the final day of the festival, the Solemnity of the Assumption, or the Dormition of Mary, as Eastern Catholics call it, the bishops con celebrate the final liturgy. And everyone in attendance, whether Maronite, other Eastern Catholic, Latin Catholic, or not at all Catholic, has a chance to appreciate the Maronite culture and heritage under the protection of Our Lady of Lebanon. This has been American Catholic History. If you enjoy American Catholic History, please become a supporter. We've got great perks for supporters. Get information on how to become a supporter and the perks at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. Also on our website, sign up for our newsletter, learn more about the Shrine of Our Lady of Lebanon and Maronite Catholics, plus see about our pilgrimages like we're going to Wisconsin next year, and find other great stories from American Catholic history. Also, you can check out our new merchandise. Yes. <laughs> we also love the great reviews our listeners leave. Those and the five-star ratings help others find us. You can also email us feedback, questions, tips for episode topics, and other comments at feedback at AmericanCatholicHistory.org. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash American Catholic History, on Instagram at ACH underscore podcast, and follow us on Twitter at ACH1513. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History, made possible by listeners like you. <laughs> <laughs>